YouTube family, it's Kaylee with Radiant Church. We launched our relationship series, and wow, so many lives were changed. Pastor KJ talked to us about the power of the woman of God and what she can do when she walks in her true identity. I encourage you to watch this message because I believe it will bless you. And also, make sure to share with everyone you know so they can be blessed as well. If you are taking notes, the title of my sermon is The Power of a woman. The power of a woman. I want you to know that a woman is such, is such, is such a powerful person. When God created a woman, I mean, he, he, he did his thing. He, he didn't make her, he didn't halfway make her. She's not a second class citizen. No, she is a first class citizen and God has used her to do such amazing things. He's used her in such a powerful way. And, and this past weekend, Pastor Tish preached that the Proverbs 31 woman is not a person. She's a prototype. When you look at her and read Proverbs 31, you're looking in the mirror. You're looking at your identity. You're looking at who you are. Women of God, you are anointed. God has put a crown on your head. If you are a wife, I'm telling you, you are your husband's crown. God has called you to do amazing things, supernatural things. Know your identity. Know your worth and allow God to heal you, restore you and rest on you so you can be the woman that God has called you to be for your family, for your spouse, for your house. When you are a woman, you are called to do great, great things. And God made a woman a little bit different than he made a man because the Bible says he made us kind of like in the bushes or, or he made us like kind of in the wild where everything was kind of in chaos and disarray. But when he made a woman, he made her inside of a garden where everything was in order. Everything was regimented. There was a sequence. There was color. There was beauty. There was like, like if we had a men's conference, all we need is some hot dogs and that's it, like outside. With a woman, y'all got to have flowers, photo booths. It got to look good. I am her jacket. It's like a woman, it's a vibe. As a guy, it's not a vibe. We just in here, ain't matching, ashy, <laughs> need to wipe our nose and sweating on the top of our forehead. Women don't get down like that. Why? Because a man was made in a wild and a woman was made in a garden where there was order, where there was beauty, where there was splendor, where there was majesty. So man of God, don't get mad when she needs to decorate your home. Why? She's making her garden. And just because you can live in the wild don't mean she has to. Man, God, I shouldn't have came to church today. Should have, should, have, should have stayed in bed for this. I got you, bros. Don't worry, I got you. Um, but a woman of God, a woman of God, a woman of God, there's nothing like it. And when you truly become the woman of God you're called to be, you can move things, you can shift things, you can change things, you can, you, you can help. The Bible says that that the virtuous woman can win over her unsaved husband. You can inspire, you can influence, you can lead. There's so much power. And men of God, you need to listen to this so you can know what to look for. You can know what to look for. You can know what a virtuous woman is. And the reason why most women aren't her, and they're not the Proverbs 31 woman, is because Satan makes sure that she's hurt. Because if you're hurt, you can't be her. So Satan wants to make sure you're not healed because when you're healed, you're now empowered to be her. So ever since you was a little girl, you was rejected by mama, not loved by daddy, not treated properly, uh, in, in abusive relationships, talked down on, belittled, never seen, never endorsed, never authorized, because Satan was trying to rob you from being her. He wanted you to be hurt. So now what you have to do is say, hey, 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 hey. Though brokenness was not my fault, healing is my responsibility. I'm going to get the healing I need, the grace I need, the joy I need. I'm going to allow Jesus to remove the smears and the stains off of me so I can be the glorious woman he's called me to be. Oh, come on, women of God. Any women of God in the room? Well, if you have your Bibles, well, yeah, let's go and do it. I had a joke, but I don't know if I should say it, so we'll go to Genesis 2. I'm going to say my joke. Go to Genesis 2. <laughs> um, uh, I got two jokes. I'm saying them both. Um, there was this guy came in the house to his woman. As you go into Genesis 2, he came, he came uh, in the house to his wife. And he was like, I just don't understand how God can make someone so beautiful and so stupid. So beautiful and so stupid. So beautiful, so stupid. She must have got up out that couch. She looked at him. She said, I'll tell you why he did it. He made me beautiful so you will love me. He made me stupid so I'll love you. <laughs> Women don't say amen. <laughs> uh, there's a story of a, of, a, of a man with his, oh, there's a story of this man. He was with his wife and he was, uh, he was the mayor. He was the mayor of the city and he's in this little float with his wife. They're waving at everybody. 
And they happened to come across her ex-boyfriend who worked at the gas station. He tapped her. He said, look, there go your ex. He worked at the gas station. He ain't got no money. He worked at the gas station. But lucky for you, you married the mayor. She said, first of all, when I met you, you wasn't the mayor. Second of all, she said, lucky for you, because if I would have married him, he would have been the mayor and you would have been working at the gas station. Oh, come on, women of God. Come on now. Talk back to me. Talk back to me now. Y'all, I'm telling y'all, if these women get up, y'all better be careful in this room. Y'all better be careful. Um, Genesis chapter two. Man, I love talking about relationships. This is so fun. It says, in the Lord, uh, verse 18, it says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him, or some translations say suitable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. In other words, he had this big assignment and he's naming everything. He's naming all the animals. He didn't have no helper. And, 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 and we have seen a man. We see why God says not good that a man be alone. Have you ever left your husband for the weekend and you came back and there's Kool-Aid all on the carpet? Like, like and the dishes are in under the couch and the kids, like they painted their face with markers. And you're like, oh my gosh, Armageddon just happened in my house. What happened? I remember Pastor Sis loved me and our daughter for, for one day. And, and she's like wearing my shoes. She's drawing on the wall. She's painting on everything. And I'm like, I don't know what happened. Like she just took over everything. I needed you here. Like, like, it's not good for a man to be left alone. Nobody eats nothing. Like, you go to a single guy. He got, like, three dishes, one cup, no forks. Like, he's eating out his hand. Like, underwear on his, on his, on his doorpost. Like, dirty in there. Like, when you come, he throws everything under the bed. Go under his bed. You will see all, it's all right there. Like, he needs some help. The brother needs help, man. It's not good for a man to be alone. A woman adds structure. She adds order, regimentation to a man's life. It's not good that he should be alone. I bet Adam was misnaming all the animals. He was calling the lion. He was like, okay, you be Tweety Bird. He was calling Tweety Bird the lion. I mean, just misnaming everything. Like, like this brother needs some help, okay? God can acknowledge it. Everybody, see, it was, not, it was not good for him to be alone. And the Bible says, we'll find him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a womb man or a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is not bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they should become one flesh. Men of God, can you please leave your mama and be joined to your wife? You're a grown man. Quit running to mama. I love you, mom. I honor you, mom. But I know your role and I know my wife's role. And I ain't going to twist those two up. But thank you for making me the man of God I am and the husband that I can be. Okay, mom? You cute, though. I love you. Um, verse 25. And they both were naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay? Well, we are about to get started. Let's, let's, let's talk about this. So... The Bible says that it wasn't good for a man to be alone. We needed to find him a helper suitable or comparable to him. Now, a lot of people think that women are weaker than men. A lot of people think women are, are weaker than men. And I would say they are physically. A woman is weaker than a man physically because she has um, uh, physical limitations that he don't have because she's a womb man. She's designed to bring in children. And you go out there and fight the bears, and she'll raise the children. She'll bring in the children. She'll cook the meals. You go fight the bears. So, so they're a little physically weaker, but don't get it twisted because spirit, physically weaker doesn't mean spiritually weaker or emotionally weaker. We have said for years that a woman is more emotionally weaker than a man. In all of my counseling, I have not seen that to be true. I've seen the man weaker. The women can forgive faster. If a woman wrongs a man, 10 years later, oh, a woman can build a bridge, get over it, and forgive. You try to do, you let her do to you what you did to her, you will spend the rest of your life. Oh, you sure will. I remember me and my wife, we first started dating, and we had like a little conversation, and I was like, uh, well, you're not going to talk to me like this. I can find someone else. 
She was like, okay, well, I can talk to you better. She got over it. She said the same thing. I said, no, you can't. You can't find nobody. <laughs> I could not take what I was dishing out. I could not take what I was dishing out. And, and women, they are strong emotionally because they are orderly emotionally. See, see, a woman may cry. Let me tell you how, how heartbreak works, just to show you. A woman looks weaker at first. She'll spend the first couple of days crying, weeks crying. She's nodding up, wiping her face, wiping her makeup. Give her two weeks, she gone. When a woman's fed up, okay, like she gone, gone. Better call Tyrone, she gone. But <laughs> a man, he may look all tough at first. A year later, I just miss her. Five years later, I miss her. Ten years later, I miss her. Why? Women are strong. They are strong emotionally. So when God, here's what God did. God created a man. He gave him purpose. He gave him assignment. He gave him an assignment. He gave him dominion. And then he looked at his deficiencies. And God in his wisdom, splendor, foreknowledge, his omniscience, he looks at his deficiencies. He said, I need to create something that would cover his deficiencies. And what he did was he created man with a womb. And we would call it womb man because it was a man with a womb. And that's where we get a woman from. And she was everything to cover his mistakes, his weaknesses, and his insufficiencies. That's what she was designed to be. I want to tell you something, woman of God. You are created to be a helper. You are created to be a helper. And God says you're going to help him. You're going to build him. You're going to strengthen him. You're going to turn him into a version of himself. He didn't even know existed. You are designed to be a helper. Woman of God, you are a helper. That's what a woman is. She's a helper. And if I'm moving stuff, when I call help, I call God stronger than me. When I need help, I don't want nobody weaker than me. I want someone stronger than me. And God says, I created you a help that's strong enough to cover you, that's strong enough to hold you, that's strong enough to speak into you, that's strong enough to support you and cover you as you're going through the wounds of life. She is strong emotionally. I'm telling you, every time you see a strong man, look behind him. There's a stronger woman of God backing him, encouraging him, and supporting him. He built her to be a helper. He built her to be a helper. And women, one of the greatest ways you can help your husband, you're not going to like it because you'll feel like it's a cuss word. One of the greatest ways you can help your husband is by submitting to him. Ooh, no amens. I not one. Ooh. Can I just get two amens? Okay, I got three. Okay, cool. Um, women of God, you missed the point of submission. First off, the Bible says, submit unto him as unto the Lord. I know your excuse. He don't even follow Jesus. He don't even read his Bible. He don't even pray. I get you. We're going to deal with him. Wait till next week. I got a sermon. If you have a man thinking about dating a man, you think a man kill you, get him here. I have a sermon that's going to that's gonna knock the dust off him next week. We're going to deal with him. It's, it's going to move something in him. Your husband going to rise up. You think he was last. Bloop. He going to come alive. You better get him here. Now. I don't care if he got a vacation. Cancel, cancel, cancel. He got to be here next week. We will deal with him. But today we're going to deal with you, okay? Submission. Submission is your superpower. It's your weapon. Do you know that, that, that submission for a woman of God wasn't designed to be a weakness? It was designed to be a weapon. Before you dismiss submission, did you understand what it was? The word sub means under. If you have a submarine that goes underwater, the word sub means under. So submission means coming under the mission. That's what you're doing, woman of God. You're coming under the mission. Now, why would God ask you to come under the mission? Why would he ask you the mission of the family, the mission of the church, everything that God is doing, the business of your household, God would ask you to come under that. Now, why would he ask you to do such a thing? The reason he asks you to come under the mission is because under the mission is the position you would be able to move things the fastest. Submission wasn't a weakness, it's a weapon. If you got under the man of God, it's the fastest way to move him. You just didn't even read what God was talking about. God was giving you a major key and you thought he was giving you misery. Now, a lot of women, they frown at that position, but I would tell you there is no better position than the position of submission. Okay, let me break this thing down a little bit. 
See, in order to move someone, you have to actually be under them. If you had two wrestlers, all the time, the two wrestlers, they're moving like this the whole time they're wrestling. And what they're fighting for is position. They're trying to get underneath the other one. Or if you watch a football game, the two guys on the line, they're fighting for position. They're trying to get underneath the person because of when I get under you, I can move you. I have to get low. I have to get under you because when I get under you, I can move you. This is why your husband don't listen to you because you're talking to him from the wrong position. If you got under him, you can move him into prayer. You can move him into Bible study. You can move him into the word. You can move him into being the man of God he's called to be. You can't move him because you're talking from the wrong position. If you ever got in the position of submission, you can actually move your husband until he was truly called to be. But you can't move him because you're talking from the wrong position because women of God, You can't talk down to a man. You can only talk up to him. Because if you talk down to a man, he will shut down. So you submit to that man and you can move him. A submitted woman can move an unpraying man into prayer like that. Only an unsubmitted woman can't get him to do nothing. Because men do not respond to dishonor. They don't. They will shut down. Your men, that's why when you come with all your complaints, I just feel like you need that. Okay. Yeah. I will. Okay. Cool. Better. All right. Help. Like, he ain't even talking back to you. He's telling you that he don't want to hear what you're saying. And the reason why he don't want to hear what you're saying He don't want to hear from where you're saying it from. Get underneath him, build him up, undergird him, support him. The Bible says that that the virtuous woman, she can over, she can win her unsaved husband over to the Lord, which is honoring him and submitting to him and watering him and building him up. You are a helper. And God said, I put you underneath him because you would be a foundation that he can rest on, a foundation that he can breathe on, a foundation that he can live in. You need to be a safe place for your husband. You need to be a safe place for your home. Most of your husbands, they're working all day and they try to come home and they know you sleep because you're not safe. And let me tell you something about a man. He won't go to a dangerous place. You are dangerous to him. Do you know that one of the most dangerous places in the world for men is their own home? Is their own home. It is so dangerous. Men, they work all night. They work. Yeah, I'll take overtime. I'll take overtime. Why? Because she sleep when I get off. And I need her sleep so I can finally get some peace. Because the Bible says a contentious woman is like the continuous dripping of a faucet. Just drip, 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 drip. And your Bible said it's better for a man to live on his roof than in the house with a woman like that. That's your Bible. So women of God, how about you quit using your mouth to complain and you start using your mouth to create. Create that man of God. Build him up. Encourage him. Let him know he can do it. Babe, I know you're holding the Bible backwards. Spin that thing around. This is how you hold it. I know you can't find Proverbs. I'm going to buy you some Bibles with some tabs on it because I'm your hell. Men of God, you better back me up right now. Uh, you better back. This is dangerous ground. This is dangerous. You better have my back. Security! I am up here putting my life in danger to have your back right now. You better shout me down or I'll preach. I'll flip this sermon around. I will flip this sermon. Because I'm saying what you probably can't say yourself. Y'all better protect me. Women gonna get, hey, babe, we're gonna leave Pastor KJ alone today. We're not gonna tackle him. We're not gonna get him. Delete the email. He good. Good sermon. Amen. Um, <laughs> but the truth is, many husbands, their home is dangerous. Why? It's because God created you to be a wife, not a knife. And so many women are knives. He comes home, you cut him. He tries something, you cut him. He misquoted a scripture, you cut him. He fails, you cut him. He makes a mistake, you cut him. And God said you were designed to be a wife, not a knife. And instead of building him up, you cut him down. 
So as a woman of God, you're designed to build them up. You are a wife. You change things. You make things lovely. You make things beautiful. You are her. You are to influence him from underneath. You're to move him. Everyone says the man is the head. Yes, that is true. But I'm convinced the wife is the neck. She can turn him whichever way she want to turn him. Amen. I may be the head, but my wife the neck. I'm like, yeah, we going this way. She's like, no, we're not. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> guess, guess it was this way we were going. Huh? Amen. You actually can control him. And this is why the Bible cautions against women, because a lot of women, they use their control for bad negativity, manipulation. Do you know that most men can't address their wife? Because before they can get their sentence out, she's crying. <laughs> you heard me. Now he has to be muzzled and he can't talk because he's afraid of hurting you. Because anytime he holds you accountable, you start crying and manipulating. Now you're using your, your position to manipulate instead of influence. Ah. Ah. I think I'm getting something started in this church at this 1130 service. So, 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 submission, submission, submission. And I know what you're saying, women of God. Pastor KJ, how am I submit to him? He don't read his Bible. He don't pray. He don't worship. Ah, ah, ah. You submit to him and watch what God will do. Watch what God will do. And I want to tell you, next week, I'm going to deal with him for you. I am going to deal with him. God has given me a prophetic sermon. If you have a man that has not been activated into the things of God, you get him in the church next week. I don't care if you got to drag him, pull him in here. Get him in this church because I believe he will walk out not the same man. Something will be unlocking him. Get him here. Get him here. He needs to hear the word of God and he needs to hear his identity and who he is because life will beat a man up. and will beat a man into submission and silence. And when a man is bruised and his ego is bruised, he can't stand up and be the king he was created to be. He needs to hear who he is. And it's going to activate someone on the inside of him. I don't care if you got to cancel his golf trip, his hunting trip, whatever he's doing. He needs to be here next week. He needs to be here. So God has called you to be a wife, to build him up. A woman is called and designed to be something so, so powerful. When God saw Adam and he saw Adam was in need and he needed a helper comparable to him, God said, you know what? You need to go to bed, Adam. You need to go to bed. I'm going to tell you, when you have problems and struggles, sometimes you just need to take a nap. God gave Adam, the first time we see surgery in the Bible, God gave him divine anesthesia. He put him to sleep, and he caused him to go into a deep sleep. And God moved him on his side. God opened up his place of flesh. He took out a rib, and the Bible says he fashioned a woman out of Adam's rib. He fashioned a woman. Now, let me tell you what the first thing is. When he fashioned a woman, when she woke up, the first thing she did not do was run to her husband. When she woke up from surgery, the first thing she did was run to God. <laughs> Women of God, you don't need to run to a man. You don't need to run to a relationship. You don't need to run to a situation. You need to run to God. You need to put your hand in the hands of God. See, women of God, let me tell you something. If you ran after God like you run after a relationship, God will give you a relationship you ain't got to run after. I said if you ran after God like you run after a relationship, God will give you a relationship you ain't got to run after. The Bible says Eve put her hand in God's hand. And then God took her to her husband. Maybe your marriage is struggling because God didn't take you to him. But here's what many women do. They go to the house of God. They get built. They get strengthened. They get everything they need from God. And then they leave God, go find the man, grab him by his ear and try to drag him back to God. And when he don't serve God, they criticize him. And they cast again him. You don't serve God. You don't pray. You don't worship. He's like, I was like this when you found me, you know. I didn't go to church when you found me, you know. I didn't intercede when you found me, you know. So now all of a sudden, you want to go to church and hear little Pastor KJ preach with his little two tight jeans and come home to me barking orders. First of all, we need to go talk to his wife. See how happy they really is. That's number one. And then number two, leave me alone. We didn't sign up for all this. Listen, listen, listen. You're supposed to find him in the presence of God because if you don't find him in the presence of God, he is lacking a very vital component a man of God is supposed to have. And that is called purpose. 
an assignment. And what happens is a man without an assignment will always be attacked. A man without an assignment will always be attacked because guess what? The first thing God did, look, look at God. He created this man. And when he created him, he gave him instruction and he gave him a sign. Hey, cultivate the land. Hey, name the animals. Hey, have dominion over the earth. Hey, hey, rule all this. And then Adam was doing that and he needed help. The problem with most marriages is the man don't need no help. Because you don't need help playing the video game. You don't need help watching the Super Bowl. You don't need help fishing. You don't need help hunting. You don't have a purpose. And what's happening is because you lack assignment, she's attacking you because she was designed to help. And when a woman can't help, she accidentally starts to hurt. Because something inside of her says, my nature isn't being released. And now why are you sitting here? Why are you playing the game? Why aren't you getting up? Why are you always going on the weekends? I'm coming at you, man of God. And she's getting frustrated because she was designed to help you and you don't have nothing that needs help. So now y'all got together and y'all was attracted to one another. In the beginning, opposites attract, but when there's no purpose, opposites attack. Because her opposition can't be put into submission and it can't be building anything. So now she has to attack you because she can't help you. A woman will always attack a man she can't help. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, we'll come back to you. Find him in the presence. We're going we're gonna to detour a little bit. We got to finish the rib up. So God fashioned her from a rib. When he brought her to Adam, I believe she may be called woman because I think when Adam saw her, he was like, whoa, man. Like, he was like, wow, this ain't... Like, that ain't a duck, that ain't a horse, like, that ain't a lion, like, that's, whoa, man. Like, I ain't, he ain't never saw that before. He was like, ooh. And the reason why he was like, ooh, is because the Hebrew word for when God made a man, it was just like, it means to, like, just form or throw together. Like, when God made a man, he was just like, poof, he just threw you together. That's why we don't look as good. When he created a woman, it was the fashion. He got rolled up his sleeves. He got down in the dirt. He fashioned and perfectly crafted a woman. He didn't make her in the wild. He made her in the garden. She was perfectly crafted. A women need beauty. They need color. They, they need to have the freedom to express themselves because God didn't make her to be in disarray like you. He didn't create her to be like that. As a man, we can, we can live in that dysfunction. As a woman, they can't. They need structure. They need order. They need regimentation. They need clear direction. So, 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 so. What God did was he put Adam into a sleep. And when he put... Adam went to sleep, he took out his rib, took out his rib. He took out his rib and he fashioned it into a woman. I want to tell you something, man of God. Whenever God takes something out of you, he will always give you something better in replacement. Whenever he takes something out of you, he will always give you something better in replacement. God took a rib and he gave him a wife. He took a rib, he gave him a wife. And let me tell you what your wife was designed to be. So God said, I took this rib for you. And Adam woke up, he like... Lord, where's my rib at? He was like, she right there. You didn't lose a rib. It just transformed into something better. And Adam was like, Lord, this rib is designed to cover my heart. He said, I know that's her exact role. She's going to walk beside you. She's going to cover your heart. She's going to protect you. She's going to strengthen you. She's going to build you. She is your rib. That's who she is. That's what she is. She is your rib. She's going to protect you. And the rib, the rib case protects the heart. He says she's going to be right there protecting your heart, protecting you in the line of battle, protecting you from people and situations. She's not going to protect you. She's going to have wisdom, discernment. She's going to see things and protect you. She is your rib. So whenever God takes something from you, he gives you something back so much better. Now, let me tell you what a rib will always do for you. What the rib had done for Adam was Adam was opened up on his side. The rib was taken out. And then the Lord said, then the Bible says the Lord closed his place of flesh. See, the reason you're so frustrated with your wife is she's designed to close your place of flesh. See, when you're worldly, when you're fleshy, when you're not praying and seeking God, she's designed to close that place of flesh. She's designed to strengthen you and breathe into you and say, no, we have a purpose. We have an assignment. We are going to read. We are going to serve. We are going to walk after the things of God. She's designed to close your flesh. This is her assignment. This is her authority. And the thing is this. God didn't take woman 
out of a man's head because he didn't want her to be above him. God didn't take a woman out of a man's feet because he didn't, he didn't want her to be below him. God took her out of a man's side because he wanted her to be beside him, covering him, girding him up, encouraging him, breathing life into him. So we go back to the presence. We go back to the presence. This, we'll let this little circle of light be the presence. We go to the presence. And here's what God did. And here's why most marriages fail and they fight. And one or two marriages end right here because of this. We don't know the purpose of a marriage. We don't know the purpose of a marriage. We made a marriage about romance, sex, having kids, and watching TV. That's not the purpose of a marriage. You have to understand something. This is why your wife was unhappy, dude. This is why. Because you have no idea what a wife is. And where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. If I gave my daughter this microphone, you want to know what she'll do with it? Because she's two. She would throw it on the floor. So this is a $2,000 microphone. She would throw this on the floor. Let me tell you why. Because there's no difference between a football, a basketball, and this $2,000 mic to her. Why? Because where purpose is unknown, she don't know the purpose of this thing. Abuse is inevitable. You abuse where you don't know purpose. So if a man's abusing a woman, it's because he don't know what the purpose of a woman is. And abuse ain't just hitting a woman. Abuse comes from the word abuse. It means using out of normal context. See, many men are using a woman out of her normal context. She was not a sex tool for you. No, she wasn't designed to be that. God said, y'all can do that, but if you ain't, she wasn't created for that. She was created to be a helper, which means if she don't have nothing to help with, she's abused. She's just being abnormally used. She's not being used for her proper function. So what happens is before marriage, opposites attract. After marriage, opposites attack when there's no assignment. See, the problem with most marriages is the man of God don't have an assignment. Before God ever created an Eve, he first gave Adam instruction. He said, hey, you're going to have dominion over the earth. You're going to name animals. You're going to keep the garden. You're going to dominate all this. Then you shouldn't be alone. Which means if you ain't dominating man of God, you should probably be alone. So, so, so a marriage needs an assignment. Which means if you're building a business, marriage gets better. You build an organization, marriage gets better. You're building your family, your kids, you're getting stuff in order. You're moving, you're working towards something. You got goals for your marriage and vision for your marriage. It gets better. When a woman is sitting idle in the home, she will attack you if you don't give her something else to attack. She will attack you because she was designed to help you devour something. And if y'all don't have something to devour, y'all devour each other. I'm preaching good at 1130 this morning. And this is all your Bible too. I'm preaching your Bible. So check this out. If you are, if you are a man and you have no vision, no direction and no assignment for your marriage, you need to get it immediately because marriage wasn't designed to be idle. Well, man, of God, you said, well, I don't have nothing to build. Some of you men of God, maybe you have some, maybe you have a business, maybe you have a company, maybe you have an organization, maybe you have an idea, maybe you have vision for the house. You say, well, I don't have nothing to build. Jesus said, yes, you do. Because when Jesus said, I'll build my church. He was talking about through you. But you won't go to growth track. You won't get involved. You won't serve. You won't see what needs to be done around her. See, if you started serving around the church, your wife can start serving. She can start helping. She can start making a difference. And watch how happy she is serving God and working in community with other women of God. You need to get her around other women of God. You need a purpose, a plan, and a vision for your marriage. Go to Growth Track next Sunday and start serving because when you serve in the church, now you have a vision. Hey, babe. Hey, babe. We got to get up in the morning. We got to get to church. We got to get to the 930. Hey, we got to set this up. We got to serve. We got to help over here. We got to help over there. We got to help with this thing. Now you have vision to give to your bride. And when she has a vision, now you guys can align under the vision and not have division because too many marriages have division and anything that has two heads is a monster. Division is when a house has two heads. And what happens is when you don't lead and be the head, your wife grows ahead and now there's two heads and the marriage can't get ahead because it was designed to have one head. Oh my God. It's 
one o'clock. Can I continue to preach or y'all want me to close? Y'all want me to close? I can continue? I'm going to ask the men of God. Men of God, can I continue? Okay, okay. Hey, not too loud now. Hold on. Not too loud, men of God. You still got to go home with her. Not too loud. You can text me on the low. Not too loud. <laughs> so, so, one of the things that a woman is, so, Whenever God names something, he defines something. Whenever God names something, he defines something. So when God, you got to look at what God named her. He named her womb man. And we combine it, we say woman. So what is a womb man? We have to look at what a womb is. A womb is a place of incubation. A womb is a place of incubation or cultivation. What does that mean? A womb, I'll give you some examples of, the, of a womb. A womb is the, is the ground. If you go to the field, the field is a womb, which means it just simply, a womb is a place that can incubate and create life. So if you go to a field and you put a seed in it, because it's a womb, it can give you a plant. It can give you a tree. It's a place of incubation. So God said, he didn't just say she has a womb. He said, she is a womb man. Which means her ability to be a womb extends past this area. All of her, from her mind to her toes, is a womb. So she was created for cultivation and incubation. What does that mean? That means that she takes everything to another level. She multiplies everything. She grows everything. She expands everything. Example, if you give a woman food... She'll give you a feast. If you give a woman a seed, she'll give you a son. If you give a woman a headache, she will give you hell. If you give her information, she will give you inspiration. And if you give her a plan, she will give you a purpose. She's an incubator. She don't just take it. She take it to another level. She don't just take it. She take it to another level, which means if she keeps bringing you headaches, what are you giving her? What are you giving her? Because she takes what she's giving and she multiplies it and takes it to a whole nother level. A woman is an incubator. Everything she touches get better. Everything she touches grows. Everything she touches prospers. Everything she touches expands. A woman is an incubator. Which means that God said you need help. In other words, he says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, but you can't be fruitful of your own because you're bringing labor, but I've placed favor on this woman of God. And when your labor and her favor come together, now you have new life. I'm preaching good at 1130. Submission is not weakness. It's a weapon. Women of God, it's a weapon. Know who you are. If you have your Bibles, go to Proverbs 31. Let me be quick. Let me be quick. quick. Proverbs 31. I'll give you guys a second to get there. Proverbs 31. It says, we'll start at verse 10. It says, who can find a virtuous wife? See, ladies, this ain't even right. Because the Bible says, who can find a virtuous wife? It's basically saying that to find a virtuous wife is rare. It's rare. And I'm going to tell you why it's rare. It says, for her worth is far above rubies. This part. It's saying, who can find a virtuous wife? It is rare. In other words, when something is rare, it just means it's hard to find. Your Bible says it's hard to find a virtuous wife. And the reason why it's hard to find a virtuous wife is because most women aren't hurt. They're hurt. You're not hurt, you're hurt. You cannot be hurt and hurt at the same time. In order to be her, you have to be healed. So the Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman? The reason why she's hard to find is because from the moment she's born, 
The enemy does everything in his power to hurt her so she can never be hurt. Like Pastor Sid said, Proverbs 31 woman, she wasn't a person. She was a prototype. So a virtuous woman that we're reading about in Proverbs 31, she is your identity. She is who you are. When, when you read Proverbs 31, you are looking in the mirror at yourself, woman of God. You are her. But you, not, but, you're, but you can't be her if you're hurt. So she's hard to find. Most husband, husbands in this room, I'm going to say it at, at the danger of my own, at my own expense, in my own danger. Most, most men in here don't have a virtuous wife. Well, how can I say that? The Bible says who can find. It says she is more, she is far more precious than rubies. So when we look at the value of something, here's how we, we measure value. In, in, in human, we measure value by how rare something is. So the Bible says she's far more valuable than rubies, which means she's far more She's far more rare than rubies, which means rubies are easier to find than her. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you was walking around and found a ruby? Well, you probably never found a virtuous woman either, a virtuous wife either. She is rare because most women aren't willing to do the construction and pop the hood and do the healing and the reflecting and the refining and the reshaping and the cultivating to become her. But that is your identity. That is your birthright. A lot of you women, single women, you're walking around talking about, I need to get married. I need a husband. No, 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 no. The Bible says he that finds a wife finds a good thing. In other words, God was saying, you're not a wife when he marries you. You're a wife when he finds you. You become his wife when he marries you, but you should already be a wife because going to an altar don't make you a wife. Going to the Savior makes you a wife. Going to a man don't make you a wife. Going to the man makes you a wife. Jesus said, as you're praying, as you're seeking me, I'll make you a wife. You don't need a man. Oh, I'll read your Bible to you again because you like you don't believe me. The Bible says, who can find a virtuous wife? It didn't say who can find a virtuous woman that you make a wife. Who can find a virtuous wife? You're not a wife when I marry you. You are a wife when I find you. You don't need a man to make you a wife. Because a wife is not a position of rank. It's a conduct of character. Oh, y'all ain't ready this morning. Y'all ain't ready. We're going to jump down to verse 14. It says, she is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. Uh, what's a merchant ship? We don't know a lot about merchant ships because we have planes now. That's kind of replaced them. They still ship stuff from overseas, though, by boat. A merchant ship was a ship that traveled from overseas. And it would travel long, long, long miles. It would come from this country to this country. And all the good, the produce, the treasure, uh, the linen, and everything in that day would be transported by merchant ships. Now, something you would notice if you ever looked at a merchant ship, you would notice that a merchant ship is not a Titanic. It's not a Titanic. A merchant ship is not a cruise ship. A merchant ship is a transportation ship. And if you looked at a merchant ship, they're usually very beat up. And they're beat up because they traveled a long way. They traveled a long road. They're going through tough seas. They're going through storms and tough seas and, and raging waves and they're traveling all throughout the night and sometimes they don't have time to stop and get the repairs they need. They're traveling very far and if you looked at a merchant ship, you're like, oh my, it has scars and cuts and scratches and holes in the boat. Why does this merchant ship look like that? But when that ship lands on your shore, it comes with goods, it comes with treasure, it comes with produce, it comes with fine linen, it comes with furniture and God said, Proverbs 31 woman, you are her. You are like a merchant ship. God said, you're going to go through tough waters in tough times, you're going to get scarred, betrayed. People are going to talk about you and come against you, but you're still going to travel through the tough seas. Why? Because a skilled sail sailor was never made in smooth seas. A skilled sailor is made in rough seas. And God said you will go through rough seas, and I'm going to bring you to the shore of your family, and you're going to produce the goods, the treasure, the peace, the joy. You are her. All the women of God say, I am her. I'll give God a 10-second praise break. Now, I'm going to quickly walk you through these scriptures, and I got one point. We're close. Give me eight minutes, and we're done, which means 18. I'm playing eight. Um, it says, she is not afraid of snow for her household, 
for all her house is clothed in scarlet. Women of God, are you afraid of snow? What does that mean? I love the snow. No, it's talking about a season. It says she's not afraid of winter season. Winter is a barren season. It's when things aren't as fruitful. She's not afraid of the winter season because she prepared. You don't have to fear winter when you have scarlet. Because scarlet is designed for winter. See, a lot of you women don't have scarlet, so you fear winter. You, f- you should fear snow when you don't have scarlet. The scarlet is designed for the snow. It keeps everything warm. It keeps everything prepared in the snow. He said, woman of God, you're to prepare your house, your kids, your family. There's one day your kids are going to walk into a snow season. Have you wrapped them in scarlet first? Because when that little ugly dude in high school starts lying to her, if she's wrapped in scarlet, she'll be like, boy, boo, I serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Satan, get me behind me. But if she ain't wrapped in scarlet, she'll believe these lies. A Proverbs 31, she don't fear the snow because she's wrapped in scarlet. She has scarlet for the snow. She's prepared for what's to come. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Because the Bible says if you are, you can laugh with no fear of the future. You can laugh with no fear of the future because Jesus holds your, he holds your future. We'll jump down to verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So what that got to do with her? Everything. Everything. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. That a wife is her husband's crown. A wife is her husband's crown. What does that mean? If I set an ordinary man down and put a crown on his head, that ordinary man becomes a king. When you came into his life, you were to make an ordinary man into a king. That was your assignment. That was your role. Most of the the greatest nobilities and, and, and kings that we have of the past usually is accompanied by a stronger queen. In other words, Proverbs 31, in the position of submission as you lead him, you are to build him up and honor him and respect him and speak over him and to water him in such a way that he would have the confidence to step out. He would have the confidence to try. He would have the peace to to move into his purpose. You're to be his crown. You're to make him a king. So when he sat down, people would honor him because of the wife that he has. In other words, you would make him a man worth honoring. Is your husband worth honoring? See, you want to criticize him so much, but the question is, are you a crown? Or are you a thorn in his shoe? Uh, It says, strength and honor is her clothing. Women of God, what do you wear? Do you wear strength and honor or depression and anxiety and fear? In bitterness, in gossip. God said you should be clothed in strength and honor. That's your garments. That's what you're to wear. It says she opens her mouth with wisdom. What comes out your mouth? And it says on her tongue is the law of kindness. Are you kind or are you nasty? Because if you're not kind, then you aren't her. She's kind. Look, it says she opens her mouth with wisdom. Very few women you would ever see open their mouth with wisdom. They usually open their mouth with gossip. And on her tongue is the law of kindness. You want a man to respond? Oh, be kind. Be kind. There's nothing. See, the thing is, what men don't know, and they'll learn this next week, is God actually built a man in, a, in such a way that he's to be esteemed and honored. Do you know that God doesn't talk down to your husband? So if God don't talk down to him, why do you? See, she influences with her wisdom and her kindness. He needs to be respected and honored. If you talk down to him, you will bruise his ego. And a man with a bruised ego is good for nothing. So when you belittle your husband, you actually tear him down and make him a weaker version of himself. Every man has two things in him. Every man has a punk and a prince in him. You get the one you talk to. You talk to the punk and the man, he won't live up to his standards. You talk to the prince and the, and the, prince and the man, he'll rise to his standards. But, but that's next week's sermon. Um, it says her children rise up and call her blessed. See, this is really cool because a lot of children have to bless their parents on the back end when they get older. Thank you, mom. But they can't bless her in real time because how can they call her blessed when every time they see her, she's stressed? Most of your kids can't bless you because they got to ask you, mom, is everything okay? Mom, are you all right? Mom, why are you so stressed? Why? Because you're not operating as her. Her husband also, he praises her. 
See, if you want to know how your husband feels about you, just watch his praise. His praise will tell you everything you need to know. Well, my husband don't know how to praise. Oh, yeah, he do. Go watch him at a Cowboys game. Go watch him when Pat Mahomes is scoring a ball. You ain't seen a praiser. Look at Pat. Man, Pat Mahomes the goal. He the goal. He the goal. Man, he better than Brady. Now Brady the goal. Michael Jordan LeBron. But in you, yeah, there's my wife. He should be saying, my wife's the goat. My wife's the greatest of all time. That's what it means. My wife's the greatest of all time. He should be with his boys singing your praises. But instead, he's singing Patrick Mahomes' praises because all you do is tear him. Oh, uh, let me just stop. Oh, uh, let's move on. That's, a, that's enough. We're going to just skip past all that. It said, many daughters have done well, but you exceed them you excel them all. You exceed them all, Proverbs 31. No matter what kind of woman, I don't care who she is, what she on, Oprah, I don't care what they do. The Proverbs 31 woman excels all the women. There's none like her, none beside her. Charm is deceitful, beauty is passing, but a, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. You will be praised if you fear the Lord. I got one more point. Do y'all want me to close or finish it? Okay, I went over my eight minutes, but y'all are asking me to do that, right? Okay, cool. Just making sure that ain't on me. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll be quick, though. Uh, Luke 13, verse 11 says this. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could, not, and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and he said to her, Woman, you are loosed. From your infirmities. The King James Version says, Woman, thou art loose from your infirmities. And he laid his hands on her, and he imme and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So, just to kind of show you something, your whole life as a woman, your whole entire life, Satan has seen you, he has studied you, and he has watched you. And here's why he's done it. Do you know God is a generational God? God is the God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. Why does God do generations? Uh, I could preach on it, but there is something about the anointing, the mantle, and the authority a person carries through generations. It's strengthened. Uh, I remember when I was first called to preach, uh, there was a person, he prophesied to me. He said, um, you're going to be a powerful preacher. I'm like, I don't even know what preaching is. And I was telling him, I was like, I'm actually like an 11th generation preacher. He was like, well, that lineage is going to pass down generation." And that oil is going to increase. It's going to strengthen because the oil you're walking in, the people that came before you was your, there was your ceiling. But when you walk in your call, they become your floor. So the anointing increases through generations, which means once you walk in strongly, your kids will get a double portion of that same spirit. So God is a generational God. And when you look at the generations, you saw David and then his son Solomon came even greater. Because he followed in the ways of his father. So, 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 so honor and anointing is strengthened through generations. So your kids are going to be stronger than you because they have a double portion of what God put on you. So there's something about the yoke. It strengthens through lineage. It strengthens through leg legacy and family and heritage. The yoke is strengthened. But guess what? God isn't only a God of generations. Satan is a devil of generations. Because so does the yoke of bondage, the yoke of fear, the yoke of anxieties and depression. That's why the daughter is twice as depressed as the mother, because the yoke gets stronger from generation to generation. I'm telling you, you look close at your bride, you look close at your mother, and you will see, uh, you will see a, 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 a contrast between the two. They're, the yoke, the good and the bad, is passed down generation. And the Bible says that the sins of the father and the mother falls down to the second and the third generation. And I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, how is this possible? How does generational curses carry out? He said it's two ways. They carry out physically and they carry out spiritually. In other words, the generational curse is in the body of the child. I can prove this to you scientifically. It's called epigenetics. And epigenetics... Is, is this thing that happens where your emotions, your mood, how you feel uh, from both of your parents is stored in their DNA. So, so your, your fears, your depressions, your traumas, your anxiety, what happens is all of that is stored in your DNA coding. 
Oh, go look it up. It's called epigenetics. It's sorting your DNA coding. So what happens is when you have a children, not only do they get your eyes and your face and your nose and your ears, and you look just like your daddy, boy. Not only do they get all that, but they have dormant cells, even alcoholism, drugs, all that. That's why he was an alcoholic, just like his daddy. All of that, that, that coding, that DNA sits in that child dormant. Never activate it, and we need the Holy Spirit to come cleanse it and remove it. So here's what happened. That's physically. Then spiritually, Satan's like, boy, girl, I've been fighting your mama them and your daddy them for 20 generations. Y'all been lusting for 20 generations. Y'all been alcoholics for 20 generations. Y'all been promiscuous women sleeping around for 20 generations. Y'all been manipulating women for 20 generations. So he looks at all this and he sees the epigenetics that's unactivated inside of them. And then the devil starts to bring circumstances to activate a dormant nature. See, now daddy was alcoholic. How do we get him to be alcoholic? Okay, he can't handle his emotions. Let's get him with a toxic woman. Let's let her break his heart. And then he'll go to this guy who would give him alcohol. Now we can activate these curses that's been in his line for five generations. So now all of a sudden he touches that bottle and something lights up in a way like it should have never lit up because now he's drinking for his dad, his grandpa, his dad's dad, his dad's dad's dad. So when he picks up a bottle, he ain't drinking for himself. He's drinking for five generations. Oh, I'm preaching good. So now you have this woman of God and her mom settled for anything, took anything. Her grandma took anything promiscuous. They slept around and have all these burdens. And Satan says, if I'm going to take them from the presence of God, if I'm going to stop her from being hurt, I have to get her hurt. And the best way to hurt her is the same way her mom and them and her aunties them and everybody that was associated with them. Everyone that was associated with her, let's hurt them the same way. So now the enemy comes and what he does is he brings infirmities and he starts wrapping her up and binding her to fear, binding her to anxiety, binding her to lies, telling her she's not enough. You will never be nothing. Your mama wasn't nothing. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares about you. And he comes and he binds her up. Hold on, let me get my binding together. All right, he binds her up. And when he binds her up, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and she comes, the radiant girl. And she's like, I am her. And I'm stepping out and I'm finna serve. And I'm finna be who God has called me to be. And then the Lord tells her to step into the things of God she can't. The Lord tells her to step up and rise she can't. The Lord tells her to be great. She can't. The Lord tells her to step out and walk into what she's called to be. And she can't because she has been bound by her pain and her infirmities. The Bible says this lady had infirmities for 18 years. She's been tied up, not being able to stand straight for 18 years. Oh, but then she ran into King Jesus. And when she ran into King Jesus, King Jesus said, woman, thou are loose. They are loose, and he started tearing these ties off of her. He says, woman of God, they are loose. And I got a prophetic word for every woman of God in this place. Woman, thou are loose. You are loose into the things of God. You're loose into the call of God. You're loose into the presence of God. Woman, thou are loose. God says, woman of God, this series, I'm setting you loose. Man of God, I'm setting you loose. You're going to be who God has called you to be. You're going to go where God has called you to go. Some of y'all need to go back to your childhood. Go back to your abusers. Go back to your pain, your fear, your shame. And look it in his eyes and say, this is an eviction notice to the enemy. You can't have me or my family. The chain breakers in the room. And you already know what he's going to do. You got to send an eviction notice. Why? Because trauma don't move out. It has to be evicted. Bundles don't move out. It has to be evicted. Wow. This was such a powerful word, and I hope you learned a lot from this message. Make sure to share this with your friends, family, and even your coworkers. We would love to connect with you, so text us at 903-201-0606. And if you'd like to partner with us in giving, make sure to hit the link below.